This is a story about me, Kay Harker, when I was young. When we all were, however old we are now. A curious thing that happened to me at Christmas time, just over 30 years ago. The Box of Delights, or When the Wolves Were Running. A fantasy by John Macefield. Freely dramatized for radio by John Keir Cross. The Box of Delights. An entertainment for Christmas. My name, as I said, is Kay Harker. And on that old, far day, I was on my way from school for the holidays, back to my home at Seeking's house. My guardian, Miss Caroline Louisa, was meeting me with the car at Condicate. But I had to change, I remember, at Musborough Junction. Musborough Junction! Musborough Junction! All for Yacquardine and Newminster, go to number five, platform by the subway. All for... Ah, now stand back there, Master. We're going to shift the train. Please, I've lost my ticket. I think I must have dropped it in the carriage. Oh, one minute, then. We'll see. Thank you. Which seat we are sitting at, Master? Just there, but there's no sign of it. Uh, not under the seat, anyhow. I've looked, and not even in the crank there down at the back. Oh, I don't seem to see it neither. So you better explain at the subway. We've got to shunt this train out now. Will, will they be angry with me? Oh, they might well. All this trouble with chaps with no tickets, like last week. What happened last week? Well, they got him, so they did. He was under one of the seats, dressing up as a duchess. And in another minute he'd have finished, so not even the Prime Minister would have told the difference. Oh. And now stand back, Master, because we're going to shunt. Thank you very much. Oh, dear. <laughs> Well, hello there. Oh, good boy. Oh, nice old boy, then. Oh, I do wish I could find that ticket. Uh -huh. Good day, then, young master. Oh, good day. I see that my Barney dog has made friends with you at first sight, so he has. Yes, yes, he does seem to... And that's like... the time that likings are made, so it is. And you are looking for your ticket, I believe. Which, lo, is on the platform, dropped at your feet. Why, so it is. Oh, thank you ever so much. You must have slipped it out as you rampaged. Or didn't you? I, I just don't know, but I suppose so. And so we must be moving along, young master, or else they'll be wondering where we've got to. Especially when the wolves are running. The wolves? The wolves. But never mind, they cannot harm you. So let us be on our way, shall we? Could I give you a hand, please, to help you carry that big case of yours? No, I thank you, Master, but uh, if you would be so kind as to steady her when I swing her, then I could get her to my back, which is where she rides a triumph. Yes. <laughs> Only I do date from pagan times, and age makes joints to creak. Oh, doesn't it? I should think it does. <laughs> now, I'm going to swing. Yes. And keep it, you young Master, from rolling me over, if you would be so gracious. Uh, there, then. There. Oh, thank you, thank you. For I'm only a frail little old withered body, like the ghost of ninepence, young master. <laughs> Down, my barney dog. Good boy. Good boy. And now I was in the other train. But somehow I couldn't get that strange little old man I'd encountered out of my mind, with his green baize box and his Irish terrier, and the brightest eyes I ever saw, as alert as a bird's or a squirrel's, for all that he was only the ghost of ninepence. There were two men suddenly in the carriage with me, and although they were dressed as clergymen, they made me uneasy for some reason. Before they settled down, they kept peering about in a furtive way, as if they were looking for someone, and even at one time under the seats. One of them had a round, chubby face, and the other a thin, foxy face. Going home for the holidays, young sir? Uh -huh. Yes. Yes, I am. And very seasonable weather for it, too. We are to have snow, it seems. And no doubt you enjoy snowballing and bargaining and making snowmen. I do, rather. <laughs> boys, wherever, boys. And do you travel far, may I ask? Only just to Condicate, sir. Ah, indeed, Condicate. It appears that there's to be quite a gathering at Condicate this Christmas, one way and another. Quiet, careful. I beg your pardon, friend. 
I merely meant that the district should be more than usually crowded this year on account of the special seasonal celebrations at Tatchester Cathedral. <laughs> of course, of course. Now I wonder, my young friend. Oh, oh hmm? what was that? What was what, young sir? I thought I saw some big dogs go rushing past along the corridor. Dogs, indeed. Some of the friends of man, as they're called, are what? These ones didn't look very friendly. They were all fierce and snarling and snapping their teeth. I fear I noticed nothing in my humble, unobservant way. But you were about to ask our young travelling companion something, friend. <laughs> Merely if he would perhaps be doing any card tricks during his Christmas holidays, eh? If you please, sir, I don't know any. <laughs> but you are of an observant turn, I see. Uh, what, what? I fancy you would be good at them, don't you think, Tristan, that he has the face of one certain to be clever at card tricks, or what? Just the very facial angle and the Borromean index. <laughs> Just so. Now, let me see if I happen to have my cards with me. Ah, oh, yes, I have my old companions. No doubt our young friend has been instructed not to play cards with strangers in a train. Mm -hmm. Well, as a matter of fact... <laughs> I am inclined to agree with you, Lancelot. But there will at least be no harm in showing him one of the tricks with which sharpers deceive the unwary, right? Indeed, indeed. Uh, let me demonstrate the commonest trick, often known as spotting the lady. I deal out three cards, so. And one of them is the queen of clubs and the other two low-numbered hearts. Now, mark them well. I twist them and shift them and set them upside down. And lo... Now, which is the lady, the queen herself? That one, I'm certain. <laughs> <laughs> so it is. <laughs> so it is. Oh, what it is to have young, sharp eyes go in, what? Huh? It wasn't his young eyes. It was your clumsy dealing. <laughs> Perhaps so. I lack practice. I, I must give myself some incentive. If you beat me this time... You shall have sixpence, for indeed I must be put upon my metal. All right. Now, prepare. Watch now the whirling cards. They shift, they lift, they dive. Twiddle, 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 pussy cat and fiddlestrings. And can you tell the lady this time, Master Kay? Yes, here she is. But uh, I... Uh, and right. <laughs> and right again. Here's your sixpence. I thought I was discreet. But you have an eye like a lynx. As I said, the very Boromian index itself. On his brow it is written. Uh, now, may I try once again? If I beat you this time, you shall give me half a crown for the poor box on next Sunday's collection. Huh? But please, sir. Of course, of course. That would be simply sportsman's honor. Ah, uh, agreed, Sir Dagonet. Now, hark to Merlin. Again, the fatal sister spins her web. Mark well her hand, the hand of destiny. So shoots the weft across the serried warp and back. The sword beats and the sheer descends. Now, <laughs> which is the lady? This one. I saw her from underneath as the cards went down. Oh. <laughs> Oh, no, it's only the three of hearts. Now, how did that happen? Oh, right, right. Yeah. And that will be just half a crown, please. For the collection in aid of the decayed cellarers. Oh, poor fellows, oh, what, what? Oh, well, there, there you are, I suppose. But, but, uh, a debt of honour, you know, young, young Mr. Harker of Seeking. Now, look here. How do you know about me? We've never met before, but that's twice you've mentioned my name. <laughs> Magic, no doubt. There is a proverb, more no Tom Fool. Than Tom Fool knows. Not that we want you to think that we think you're a fool. <laughs> By no means. But this is conducted itself, I fancy. Uh, where the hawks get out to wait for the chicken, Palamedes, if the chicken is still on the wing. Not so loud, not so loud. And so here we are, here we are then, Mr. Harker. Uh, permit me to help you down with your case. Well, thank you very much. Oh, yeah. That's it. We may meet again, young Kay, although in many ways, I hope not. But I say, look here. Goodbye. Goodbye. There's your guardian, Miss Caroline Louisa, coming over to meet you. Goodbye. Or possibly au revoir, young Kay. Goodbye. Oh, dear, dear. How did they know?
Well, there you are then, Kay. Hello, Miss Caroline. It's good to see you. I've got the car out there already and waiting. Oh, just a minute. What are you patting your pockets for? Oh, I think... I think there must have been pickpockets in the crowd. Yes, they've got my purse and my dollar watch. When did you see them last? Well, just a few minutes before we reached the station. Did you notice any suspicious person near you? No. There were only a couple of clergymen in the train. From the missionary college at Hope Under Chester's, I dare say. And I doubt if they would have done it. We'll speak to the police inspector. Yes, thank you. Oh, but I'm not telling you the news, Kay. But rather a shock to give you. All the Jones children are with us for the holiday. All of them? I do hope you won't mind too much. No, I don't mind at all. I like the Joneses. Well, there is rather a gollop of them. There are only the four. Jemima and Mariah and Susan and Peter. Yes. I'm putting Peter into your room and I hope... Oh, wait a minute, Miss Caroline. Before you start, look. Look, there he is. Just coming out among the crowd. Who? An old man I met at Musgrum with the big box on his back and the little terrier dog. Do you see? He looks like a Punch and Judy man. Perhaps he is. I say, may I offer him a lift? He's rather a poor old chap to be lugging those loads about. Yes, by all means. I won't be a minute. I say, there, sir. Well, then, good day again to you, young master. I say, sir, would you please tell me if you are a Punch and Judy man? I am, so to speak, a showman, and my Barney dog, as it were, is my Toby dog, when chance has called. I was to ask you, would you like a lift down into the town, as it's rather a step and it's so cold? No, I thank you, my young master. But, uh, there is something that no other soul can do for me but you alone, Master Harker. Oh? As you go down towards Seekings, if you would stop at the muffin shop now, and near the door you will see a lady wearing a ring of a very strange shape, like this of mine, with the long ways cross of gold and garnets. And if you say to this lady, the wolves are running, then she will know, and others will know, and none will get bit. Yes, of course I'll do that. But how did you know my name? When wolves run, it betides to know, Master Harker. And I do bless you, but we must be on our separate ways now, you and I, for time and tide and buttered eggs wait for no man. Come, Barney Dog. I'm sorry, Miss Caroline, but he said he had to go on his own. Oh, pity. Yes. You know, Miss Caroline, there's something very queer about that old man. Oh. Do you happen to know if Ellen has got buttered eggs for lunch? Yes, she has, as a matter of fact. He knew it. He said, time and tide and buttered eggs wait for no man. I expect a good many have said something of the sort. Oh, no, he meant me and that I ought to hurry up. You know, there's something uncanny about him with his bright, bright eyes. He knew my name and where I came from. And come to that, so did those two curate chaps in the train. They could have read that from your luggage labels on the rack. Yes, I suppose so. I say, are there any muffins for tea? No, I'm afraid not. Oh, well, would you mind frightfully if I got some from the muffin shop? I do like muffins, especially at Christmas time. Well, yes, I suppose so, but do hurry, Kay. Yes, I will. I'll go on to the car. Right, I won't be long. Excuse me, ma'am. Are you the lady? Yes, I am the lady, Kay. Do you not see my ring? Yes. Yes, I do, and I was to tell you, ma'am. I was to say, from the Punch and Judy man, I was to say, the wolves are running. Thank you, Kay. I was waiting to hear. Thank you very much. I say, I had a sudden idea. If you should happen to be seeing the Punch and Judy man... Perhaps I shall. But there are always other ways, too, by which messages can be taken to Mr. Hawlings. Is that his name? Cold Hawlings, among many others. What do you want him to know, Kay? I have some friends staying with me, it seems. Do you think he might come and give us a show, perhaps tonight... Say about half past five. I think it could be arranged, Kay. Indeed, I believe he might be calling on you at Sea King's house in any case tonight, since the wolves are running. Oh, might he? He has to find someone to take care of the box. The box? The box of delight. But no more now. Your good guardian is waiting for you. And thank you for the message. Yes. Yes, of course. Goodbye. Goodbye, Kay. Or au revoir. I say, Miss Caroline. Yes, Kate. I happened to run into a friend. A friend of that old Punch and Judy man. 
and I asked if he might come up to the house this evening and give a show to me and the Joneses. Oh, I think it's a very good idea. Only when he arrives, you must ask him what his charge is. Oh, yes, I'll do that. And I'll tell you another thing, Miss Caroline. Well, what's that? When we were coming out of the station just now, I looked back. And there seemed to be some big shadowy dogs all weaving in and out of the crowd and snapping at the old man's heels. Huge, sharp teeth they had. Oh, I expect they were Alsatians. But I wonder who has Alsatians in these parts? Oh, a good many people, I suppose. In fact, I've even heard that those friends of yours from the missionary college keep a pack. Oh, do they? Oh, they might. Tastes differ, of course, but I never did like such dogs myself. They're rather, well, too like wolves. Wolves? And then it was Seeking's house. In all its old spacious glory, the way I always remembered it from my previous adventures there, and as I remember it now, through this other strange adventure as well. And behold the Joneses. First of all, Jemima. Very smart, that's me. Pay no attention to this other scrubby lot, my sisters and brother. And then Mariah? Very untidy, but I'm absolutely crammed with pistols, Kay. I say, are you? I got them from some robbers I met. I simply couldn't live without pistols now. She spends her time shooting old electric light bulbs, Kay, <laughs> dangling from a clothesline. <laughs> and that was Susan, like a small, sweet fairy. And then there was Peter. I hear that you and I are sharing a bedroom, Kay. I hope you aren't one of those early getters uppers. I'll do my best not. And do you know what I hope, Kay? What then, Mariah? It's all very well for Miss Caroline Louisa to ask us for Christmas, and we appreciate oh, yeah, it. Yes. But I only hope that something exciting and unusual happens. I wish the Christmas could be bought up to date with gangsters and aeroplanes and a lot of automatic pistols, like this lot here. Shall I fire them off now? Better not quite yet. You just be careful, young man. I've never been careful in my life. I don't propose to start now. Pity anybody that ever tries to scrubble me. Well, anyway, I might have something just a little bit unusual for you all this time. Sudden idea I had. What's that, Kay? It'll have to be something good after those marvellous buttered eggs at lunch and the muffins at tea. Mm. It's a Punch and Judy show. Oh, oh so No, no, no. I've a feeling this might be something rather special. And there he is now, I believe. I'll go and let him in. Well, and I wonder what he meant you lot. Something rather special. <laughs> to the lady, sir, and it was she who told me your name. It serves, Master Kay, it serves as well as any. Can I steady you with your box again, Mr. Hollings? Ah, now I thank you. It nestles safely this time, now that the wolves don't run, at least for a little space. Please, I was to ask you from my guardian how much we were to pay you for your performance. As to that, Master Kay, suppose you were to dig down here at Seekings and found the way into what was. What would you pay for going in? I don't know. And suppose you were to dig through at Seekings and found the way into what is, what would you pay for going in? Fred, I don't know again. And I don't know that what you will give me for my show will be a fair pay for all the wonders seen. For in my box here I have another and a smaller box with other delights besides my show, as you shall see. Oh, thank you. So as to payment, shall we say um, a biscuit for my Barney dog won't break you and uh, a dish of eggs and bacon afterwards for me? There should be time. But surely, and it's very good of you, Mr. Hollings. Because uh, before all is done, young master, it is more like that I shall be beholden to you, not you to me. I, I don't think I know what you mean again. But come in now and meet my friends, the Joneses. Ah, yes, of course, of course. Good evening, good evening. Good evening. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Miss Jemima. Sir? And Miss Mariah. Sir? Miss Susan. Yes? And Master Peter. I ah. say, do you know our names, then? But indeed, Miss Jemima, for it behoves a travelling man to know many things. Unless Kay told you as you came in from the door. I swear I didn't, Susan, and it was the same the first time he met me. And besides, he looked at us each in turn as he spoke, as if he knew which was which. Mr. Hollings, are you a magician? Perhaps, perhaps I may be, Miss Mariah. In a way... And you have suddenly known his name, Mariah. And I didn't say a word about that. Why, so I did. Somehow, 
And his little dog is called Barney, isn't he? That is so. Maybe this is going to be a bit unusual after all. Do you know what baffles me? You coming through all that blizzard out there, Mr. Hawlings, and not a mark of it on you. The blizzard is now dying a little, Master Peter. Very soon it will have gone. And no more than a mantle of good snow around you for Christmas. Yes, but all the same. I have my secrets, Master Peter. For I've been a long time on the road, so I have first and last. How long, sir? I get a little out of my reckoning, Master Kay, but uh, first there were pagan times, then there were in-between times, and then there were Christian times, then there was another in-between time, then there was Oliver's time, and then there was pudding time. But there have been a lot since then and more coming. And the time I liked best was just before the in-between time, what you might call Henry's time. You know... I like you very much indeed, Mr. Hawlings. You make it all so simple somehow. Thank you, Miss Susan. Ah, but now, Master Harker and friends, now that we are met, I think I shall play more for you than just my punch and duty. For a travelling man collects as he goes. (laughs) Or doesn't he? I reckon he does, myself. Ah, so he does, the bright Miss Mariah says. He collects, and what he collects, he shows. And so look here. Within my box. It's a little box. And it's very strange somehow. All polished and shiny and covered with a kind of leather where it hasn't worn away to show the wood. It's known as shagreen leather, Miss Susan. And that is the skin of sharks. Oh. And do you see the wood itself? All black and shiny too. And it looks so hard. Is it what they call lignum vitae wood? It's the wood the phoenix builds in. Is it really? I've always wanted to see a phoenix. And perhaps you shall someday, with the aid of the box. It looks so old. Centuries and centuries. I dare say perhaps it may be, Master Peter. But now, lo, I open it. And behold. Oh, it's like a little book inside. Pictures. Hosts and hosts of pictures. And all glowing so brightly. So let us see if we can perhaps make one of these little pictures come to life, shall we? Yes, yes. I seem to remember that Miss Susan is uh, fond of uh, butterflies. Oh, I I love them. Then let us see if I can't call a few from the box. And in spite of the cold, are you ready? Yes. 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 Then watch. Watch. It seemed in that old room that the ceiling above us suddenly opened into a forest on a tropical night. Even though there was the snow outside all spreading crisp and even now that the blizzard itself had stopped, we could see giant trees with the stars in their boughs and fireflies gleaming out among the lower sprays and then, lo, the sun was shining. And there were green and grey parrots and scarlet cardinal birds pecking down at the fruits. And out of the leaves there came butterfly after butterfly, bursting out of cocoons and chrysalids into images of lively beauty bright as jewels. They came and settled on our hands, the golden creatures, and glistened and quivered there. Little Susan had as many as nine at once, and a big shining blue one that perched on her hair. And then, at last, they all went spiring up into the bright tropic day again and flickered away among the trees and out of sight far up. And the forest disappeared. And it was the seeking ceiling again. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hawlings. It was a fine pleasure, little mistress. And now I might show you another little play which many an ancient queen has watched in her palace by the bank of the Nile. Have you ever heard of Hearn the Hunter, Master Kay? Oh, yes, of course I have. I've always loved Hearn. Then we might go hunting with him, perhaps. And he is an old friend. Hmm. Through the forest, and he and his great antlers. Or, on the other hand, you mentioned the phoenix just now, and perhaps... But hark! The carol singers. Kay! Kay, my dear. Oh, 
It's the carol singers. They've just arrived this moment, Miss Caroline, at the French windows. Shall we open to Yes, them? certainly. Susan? All right, I'll go. Kay, I've got to tell you something. I'm afraid it's bad news. Oh, dear. I'm afraid my brother's ill in London. I've just had a message. Oh, I am sorry. I'll have to go to him tonight, I'm afraid. Tonight? Will you be back for Christmas itself? Oh, I hope so. And Ellen and Jane will look after you all in the interval. Let's go over to the singing, shall we? Surely. I say those don't look like convict singers, Miss Caroline. No, they aren't. They're some of the congregation from Tatchester Cathedral. And there's the bishop himself leading them. We must ask them in for cocoa when they finish. There's quite a crowd of them. And, oh, there are two faces that I do recognize. Those two men at the back. They're the ones I met on the train, Miss Caroline. I dare say the missionary college are helping out at a time like this. The chief of it is a very worthy and devout man, a Dr. Bottledale. I could swear there are some of those Alsatians prowling out behind the crowd. Oh, really, Kay? You have Alsatians on the brain. Good evening, good evening, one and all. Well, good evening, my Lord Bishop. That was delightful. A small seasonal gesture from us Tatchester folk to all at Seeking's house. Thank you, Bishop. Won't you all come in and let me make you some cocoa against the cold? No, thank you. We must be on our way. We were held up earlier by the blizzard and we have much ground to cover. But I wanted to remind you all, too, to come on Christmas Eve to the great cathedral celebration. Will you? Oh, yes. 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 There's been a midnight celebration every Christmas Eve since the foundation. And this will be the thousandth. A remarkable occasion, and so we wish this festival to be especially memorable. I'm sure it will be. And I'll see to it that they're all there. Thank you, thank you. So, come then, my friends. Let us push on our way. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night, huh? What? Good night, Master Kay, and thank you for the offer of refreshment. I was right. That was the voice of the foxy-faced man. Close the window, Peter, or you'll all catch your deaths. Now, I really must rush and pack, Kay. I've not much time. Very well, Miss Caroline. And all behave yourselves. Promise? Oh, yes, yes, of course we will. Did you see, Master Kay? The wolves? The wolves, indeed. Four-legged and two-legged. And they are after me again, even here at Seeking. But why are they after you, Mr. Hollings? This is between you and me, but do you know the spot known as Arthur's Camp on the high hill behind us? Of course. Could you meet me there at midnight when I can tell you more and beg your help? Yes, certainly. I think I can manage to sneak out when Peter's sleeping, but... No I... more now, Master. I must go with my Barney dog and go secretly. Don't forget, Master Kay. I won't. I'll be there. And a happy Christmas to you. And to you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Once before, some of you may remember, I told another story about Seeking's house called The Midnight Folk. It was about a famous treasure that was almost stolen by a great wizard named Abner Brown and a governess of mine before I went to school who turned out to be a witch, Miss Sylvia Daisy Pounceye, now Mrs. Abner Brown. And this night, of 30 years ago, as I stole away from sleeping Peter, my way led me through a short cut to Arthur's camp called Haunted Lane, past an old ruined monastery known as Monk's Peace. As I went, very stealthily, I heard voices coming from it, and I cowered down behind a fragment of old wall. And so, and so then, all my efforts gone for nothing. Those fools let him trick them at Musborough Junction, and again this evening at Seekings, where dwells my ancient foe, the boy K. Harker. Ah, that's what, Abner, that's what, so it is. My thundering skies, coal haulings, the great coal haulings, slip beyond my grasp again. Ah, my thundering skies. Yes, Abner Brown himself again. I recognized him at once. Even if he was dressed up and disguised as none other than the Reverend Bottledale of the Missionary College. So I was up against magic as well as crime. And it was confirmed when I saw who his companion was. 
in the guttering light of a candle end they lit among the ruins. Another old enemy of mine, from the cellars of Sea Kings, a large and disreputable rat. Ah, that be dark doings, Abner. That's what I don't like him, so I don't... And is this my old friend, the rat, speaking? <laughs> my trusted spy along the secret ways? Ah, maybe I was and maybe I weren't. <laughs> Maybe so it is me, but what's the good of being me? Up in the attic and down in the cellar all hours for one who'd sell his mother if he had one for what she'd fetch his old bones. Oh, talk, talk. It's all you ever do. Uh, what do I get by it? Hey, bacon fat, you might say, or the green of that cheese the dog won't eat, or the haggy that made the hen swoon. But I don't, my Christian friend. I get rheumatic, and the dog sick to me. That's what. As a matter of fact, I've got some green-looking cheese for you now. <laughs> give me a, give me a. Though you wouldn't if you could sell it to a tourist's rest. You're right, they wouldn't. But come, waste no more time. Give me your report. <laughs> you want you want, Harvey. He's a getting rid of his dog. That's nothing. A lady friend will take the dog. And there's many a dog as I've loved more than that barney one now lies in a watery tomb with a stone round his neck. But some who claim to be friends never take a nint, that's what. To the point, to the point, wretched rat that you are. Ah, dark doings, that's what. Of course you scared him, Abner, and I'd be all there scared. Good, <laughs> good. Now, where have you been and what have you heard? I've gone many a dark savage, first and last. I followed them that you what of through passages near all London and round this town and peered and spied on them. Well... <laughs> You haven't a morsel of bacon rind on you, Abner, now I've finished my cheese. You shall have bacon rind tomorrow, if your news be worthy of it. Ah, that's the bacon rind to bring the plump on a man. Bacon rind tomorrow. That and marabone the day after proper makes you first shine. Silence! Tell me what you heard or I shall box your miserable ears. Yeah, you'd be proper lost without these same your miserable ears, that's what. Then tell me what they did here and where. They had a meeting at an inn called the Drops of Dew, upper room. That there lady with the ring and such. And one that you what of is a trying to get out of your trap at dawn this very morning at a place I what of. Ah. And will he have the goods on him? I heard what I heard, that's what. Oh, come on, Richard. I've been a cellar man, I haven't. I've been a poor man living in the dark, though others live in the light and grudge a poor man so much as they old fishbone, yes, they do. You says to me, find out what they decide. Them was your words to me. Find out, you says, what they decide. To the point. Yeah, yeah. And what your words was to me, that I done, although in danger of dog in them dark dwellings. Yes, yes. Now, you says, Willie and the goods on him. <laughs> you didn't tell me about that, no, you didn't. Rat, if you do not speak to the point, mm -hmm. you will be pegged beneath the waterfall like my servant, the boy. Ah! You will be turned upside down like my servant the bodiless head. Oh. Speak. Where will Cole Hawlings try to escape my ring? Will I have my bacon rind tomorrow? You shall have three whole rancid kippers and a haggis. Come now, whisper it, mm -hmm. for even ruined walls like these can have ears. Ah. Yeah. And so what they decided was this. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's what, sweetie. That's what, that's what. Aha! Uh -huh. And so I have him at last, at last. You shall have your kipper's <laughs> rat, for you have done well after all. You have done superbly, my brave rat. Ah, that's what. Uh, so, is there any other little dark job you want done then, Master Abner? Or shall I go now? You may go. <laughs> right then. <laughs> Now berries red hang over it, and pale berries of mist all. It's my delight to go by night to shoot them with my pistol. Oh, 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 oh. Here, 
here I am, Kay. You're a little late, young master. I'm sorry, I couldn't help it. I happened to be overhearing something and it seemed important to us. All things are important when the wolves are running. I thought I saw some of them as I came up to the camp here. Red eyes in the darkness. Oh, they cannot harm you. Not when you have the box. The box? My box of delights and a great treasure, Kay. That is why I wanted you to meet me here, so that I could give it to you for safekeeping. To me? Master Kay, once before you defeated the great wizard, Abner Brown, and I feel you can do so again. You know that it's Abner against us, then? Oh, yes. It's just what I've overheard myself, and I also heard that he was going to try and stop you escaping from his ring. That gang of his dressed up as curates, only I didn't hear where. He will be hard put to it, but just for safety... I want you to take the box and guard it well. Or won't you? Yes, of course I will. It is a great mystery, my box of delights, Master Kay. It was invented long ago by a great magician named Arnold of Toady. With its aid, it is possible to go into the past, as Arnold himself did. It came into my possession in an honorable exchange for a, a secret of my own. So there are many reasons why it must be kept from coming to Abner you understand? I, I think so, sir. And so, take it. And there are two other things I must tell you about it, besides going into the past and the treasures there and all the living pictures from it that I showed you and many more. Yes, sir. When you open it, so, there is that little lever there. And if you press it to the right, you can go small, Kay. And if you press it to the left, you can go swift. I see. That is how you will protect yourself from the wolves, two or four. And so let us hurry. But there's so much to tell you, Mr. Hollings, about Abner and Rat. There is no time, young master. I must go to prepare my escape from the ring. And if you want to see how I do escape from it, would you be at Butler's Down at dawn, just over the hill there? Or wouldn't you? Oh, yes, I would. Good. And bring your friend Peter with you this time as another witness, if the need should arise. So now, press to the left and go swift, Kay. But, Mr. Hollings... Press quickly and guard it well, Kay, for time is very short and I must go to my destiny. Yes, sir. I pressed, and in an instant I was back at Seekings. I really understood nothing apart from the fact that I had the box of delights clutched closely to my breast and that I was determined to keep it safe. And then it was dawn. And I woke grumbling Peter and forced him to go with me to Butler's Down to see Cole's escape. But alas, there was no escape for him after all, as you shall hear. And so, later in the morning, Peter and I hurried to see my old friend, the Condicate Police Inspector. Well, well then, Master Kay, Master Peter, so what's all this, eh? Hey? Please, you must help us, Mr. Inspector. He's been scrubbled. Now, now, calm yourself, calm yourself, my boy. Who's been scrubbled? The old punch on Judy man, up at the spinney at the top of Butler's Down. We saw it with our own eyes early this morning. He was walking along beside the spinney and suddenly four men ran up and one of them threw a sack over his head and they bundled him away and into an aeroplane. Oh, an aeroplane, eh? It looked like a kind of cross between an aeroplane and a motor car, as if it could serve us both, only this time it was in its flying mood and it soared away with him and was lost to view. And uh, did you shout and raise an alarm when you saw all this? I'm afraid we didn't. We were just spellbound, and it all happened in an instant. Well, now, if it happened at all, it sounds like the aerodrome to me, over Yockwooding Way. Those young fellows, Master Kay, serving their country, and away from the civilizing influence of their mothers, just full of high spirits, and the spit of what I was myself when young... It was a, a Christmas gamble and a bit of what you call ragging. But it didn't seem like a rag at all. We're positive it wasn't. And what's more, we're positive that it was Dr. Bottledale of the missionary college that's behind it. Ah, now, Master Kay, there you do go too far. The Reverend Dr. Bottledale is a pillar of the church and respectability. I have sung in the glee club with him time and time again. A very sweet tenor. We'd show you the tracks where the old man was scrubbed, only there's been more snow since and they're all covered. And I'll tell you another thing. My guardian, Miss Caroline, yes? she went to her brother in London last night. But when we telephoned this morning, she'd left there, but she'd never arrived here. 
So she's another one who's disappeared. And mm. my sister Mariah. What? Oh, I meant to tell you, Kay, when we were at the house just now before we hurried here. Jemima and Susan both say she just vanished into air. There's not a sign of her anywhere. Oh, come now, gentlemen. It strikes me that you're only worn out with learning, just back from school. And what you fancy all these scrobblings turn out to be no more than frolic. Frolic? They certainly don't seem like frolic to us. <laughs> And that was that, whether we liked it or not. Nor were those three the only disappearances in the tale of the Box of Delights before all was done. But now there was Abner. There was always the terrible Abner Brown on my mind. And I determined to try to find out his plans, if I could only discover where his hiding place was. Now I had a little secret hiding place of my own in those days, when I didn't want Ellen the housekeeper or anyone to see me, and that was under the valance of my dressing table. So I crept there now and took out the box itself. It seemed very strange in its shiny, nearly black colouring in that little familiar place with the mouse hole between two of the floorboards where I'd once dropped a sixpence. I knew what it was like to go swift with the box's help. Now I wanted to go small. So I pushed the little lever to the right. Instantly I was small, and I'd slipped down into the mouse hole itself. I was so tiny, and there was my sixpence beside me, as huge as a millstone. And there was the little mouse himself, no bigger than I was. Well, hello then, Kay. Hello. How are you, mouse? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Oh, very well, thanks, except I'm a bit puzzled. And I wonder if you could help me, perhaps. I'd like to very much, if it's something good. I think it is. It's against Abner Brown, at least. Oh, then that it is good, although I'm frightened to death of him. Do you know where he hides? An old inn in the town called the Prince Rupert's Arms, down in a big underground place. And can we get there by <laughs> underground ways ourselves? Yes, we can, but it's a long way. I think we can solve that. If you hold my hand while we're about it. We'd better take swords. I've got some huge ones here that I made out of darning needles that have fallen down from to the time to the time. We've got to pass the walls of the gulf in their headquarters. Along this way. Come along. Right. <laughs> Himself, see him through the other little mouse hole there, and Sylvia Pouncer and Rat too, and another little rat with him. Listen, listen, mouse. And so then, rat, what have you to report now after your blunder? And whom have you got there, that idiot-looking fellow? I make so bold as to present my nephew, Master Abner. Make a reverence to the gentleman and lady you. What's your nephew's name, Rat? How he answers to any name, so he do, Madam Sylvia. Alf or Bert or any name. He ain't earned a name better than one of them, that's why. And what has he to tell us? Why did you bring him? Because he took over to Spain in the dark ways after I left off last night and in danger of dogs, so he went. And what did he find out? Since your report was negative. And the box wasn't on coal after all when we scrubbled him. He has plainly hidden it somewhere, my Abbey. I know that, my Sylvia, my brightness. But he won't talk, even if we do have him prisoner in the terrible deeps by the sluice. He could be made to talk. Not coal. I'll say that for him after all his wandering centuries. But come, what has this nephew of yours to say to me, rat? <laughs> so right then, Alf. I up, little mate, and tell the gentleman. Ah, wet me, hoardy, sitting a carry up me, up me, was all, and the watch, watch, could be there, I drop me dupe now. What is his name? Honoured company. My nephew Alf, what is here, and don't often stand in such presence. He says he went a faithful to orders the drop of dew after I left. Do we hear what was what from them, what you were of? Oh, fool! 
Do you want to be pegged beneath the waterfall like my seventh boy? Yeah. Do you want me to strike you on the head with a timetable like the boy so that your legs telescope into your body and through your shoulders? Oh, no. What was what? Where did Cole Hollings put the box? Oh, we call it his seat in it. Put it in it. Oh, it's something that's something that's seeking his seat in it. He says someone in seeking's house, that's what. I knew that. I suspected that he had little time for anything else, but where? Oh, it's according to Pedro, the secret toys, Miss Rowell. All he cares is of no order, Governor Demi, if you don't know, no. He says he don't know. Get out. Get out, you idiot pair. My thundering skies, am I always to be surrounded by fools? Hi, I say. Come on now. Oh, stop it. Come on, come on. Come. He says there ain't no bacon right after all. No, no any handy nor anti kipper, even although he kissed the water. Give me your little paw, and I won't be there again. Ah, oh, my thundering skies, indeed. I am surrounded by fools and blunderers. Except for me, my topaz and diamond. Yes, yes, except for you, my inspiration and my ideal. And yet... Yet what, my do? I sometimes think that you and some of the others, like that fool Chubby Charles, I sometimes think you feel the old man may be slipping and be setting up as leaders yourselves. Ah, oh, no, never, my ass. I hope not, my empress, for there is a deal of life in the old dog yet. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> now, to work. Of course I guessed that the box was at Seekings. That is why we scrobbled Miss Caroline in London. My hated successor, oh, that little mildew of a boy, Hucker. But she knows nothing, lying now in the dungeons of the deep sluice by Condicut Weir herself. Perhaps the bishop, my emerald, could Cole have slipped it to him at Seekings when he called. They're, after all, old allies, one way or another. Perhaps, perhaps indeed, my ruby, and I shall act upon it. And there is the other avenue to be pried into, too. The promising child, Marie. She might well be a worthy ally. I almost like her in her passion for guns and gangsters. She may know or find out for us. Do you have her safe? Foxy Joe called on her first thing with the motor plane and got her out of the house on a pretext. She is ready and waiting for us at uh, you know where. Good, good. And in due course, we shall milk her of her secret knowledge. But first, there is much else to do to rectify these eternal blunderings from such as a rat. I am yours to command my priceless pearl. I tell you this. My blue and yellow sapphire, I will have that box before all's done, with its pleasant toys of living pictures, with its gifts of going swift and going small, but above all, with its elixir of eternal life, and its gift of travel to the past, and all the mighty treasure to be found there, to be filched by Abner, and brought under his eternal downy wing. The gold of Alexander, the trophies of the Trojan Wars, the wealth of conquering Caesar, the jewels of the Armada, oh, oh. such as coal would use the box only for good purposes. I, for mine own, my towers at last, as the poet says. So come, my Sycorax. I come, my idol, my Roland's sweetest child, to the darkest tower of all. <laughs> I wish I could tell you of all the marvels I encountered through the box before those final events of all. It seems the Box of Delights was invented long ago by an old medieval wizard named Arnold of Todi, who wanted to travel in the past. Another famous magician, called Raymond Lully, had invented an elixir of life, and he wanted to exchange it for Arnold's box. But Arnold wanted only the past and not the future and so he gave the box to Raymond. But before Arnold finally parted with it, he took one last great leap backwards through the centuries and got lost there, stranded in time, somewhere about the period of the Trojan Wars, the lady said, and as far as I know, he is there to this day. But my own real concern now was the present and the piling events there, and indeed they were piling, for suddenly... Just as I was emerging from my secret hiding place, 
under the valance of my dressing table, suddenly the remaining Joneses rushed into my room. Hey, the Look. newspapers. What about them? Look there, Kay, the great big headlines. Oh, it's dreadful, Kay. Look just there. Let me see. Startling disappearance of the Bishop of Tachester. <gasps> no. And then it goes on, that special pompous way they seem to write, it goes on, considerable alarm was caused in ecclesiastical circles last night when it was known that His Grace the Bishop of Tachester had failed to return to the palace. And was not heard of at the time of our going to press. The very reverend gentleman had signified to his sister, Dame Eleanor Chasuble, that he would go for a walk through the precincts before retiring to rest. When he failed to reappear at his accustomed time, Dame Eleanor proceeded to the precincts herself, but could not see him. At first, she thought it likely... And then it finishes up? Naturally, his grace's disappearance has cast a gloom upon what would otherwise be a festal city. We would remind our readers that on Christmas Eve at midnight, His Grace hoped to celebrate the great occasion of the thousandth anniversary of the dedication of the cathedral. And we need hardly add. And then in the next edition... Another mysterious cathedral disappearance. Dean of Tachester missing since tea time. Ecclesiastical and other circles have been convulsed by the strange disappearance of the well-known Dean from the precincts. It appears that the Dean went out shortly after dark last night. And in the very next, again... Eshal! Eshal! Canons of Tachester vanish! Another dreadful religious mystery! Murderous gang at work! Well-known local police inspector states that bloodhounds of law on trail, but if state of affairs continues, small hopes of special cathedral thousand celebrations! Eshal! Eshal! And then, to depress us further, something else happened. But at the same time, something to cheer us up as well. We were sitting disconsolately at tea, for we still had to eat, when suddenly the door opened. I thought for a moment it was Ellen, the housekeeper, bringing more muffins. But when I looked up... Mariah! Mariah! Hello, you lot. Any muffins to spare? I'm famished. Well, what on earth's happened to you? Oh, uh, this and that, you know. Mm. I say, these are jolly good, aren't they? Oh, Mariah, don't, please don't. She always does like to keep people in suspense. Come along, what has happened, Mariah? You've no idea how important it is. All right, then. I'll come clean. The truth is that I was scrobbled. Me, Mariah Jones, just like a greenhorn. But how, Mariah? There was a car came for me before you lot were up. A great big car driven by a man who kept on saying, ha-ha, what? I know him, all right. Anyway... Here's some tale of an invitation to go with a party of clergymen to see some rare stained glass at the church at St. Griswold's. Only a hope under Chester's. I thought it might be fun. I always did like stained glass. The missionary college again. Hope under Chester's. But I was hardly inside the car than some big iron shutter slammed shut all round. It all went dark. And then the car gave a lurch and soared upwards. It changed into an aeroplane. Well, I never... The same car they got coal haulings in, I bet. I say, have they scrobbled Mr. Hawlings too? They've scrobbled practically everybody. Oh, dear, it gives me the fan tod, so it does. Go on, Mariah. Well, next thing I knew, I was in a big, dampish room with sound of running water somewhere, and there was a man and woman there waiting for me. Dr. and Mrs. Bottledale, they said. Sylvia Pouncer and Abner Brown. I heard they were going to question uh, you. What did they want? Said they were looking for a promising young associate who could shoot to join a gang of theirs. And they thought I was the one. And then they asked me if I knew the whereabouts of that little box Mr. Hawling showed us that time. And what did you say? I said I had the faintest idea where the box was. And although I, I was all for joining a gang, I wasn't going to join theirs. I didn't like the look of them one bit. I should hope not. And what did they do, Mariah? Suddenly stopped their silky ways and went all snarly and stumped off. And then they left me alone for hours and hours. And then the foxy man and a chubby sort of man came in, and they questioned me about the box too. But I stuck to my guns. And in the end, they must have believed me, because I was in the aeroplane again. And it changed back to a car, and I was bundled out, and there I was, just beside Condicut Churchyard while the car drove off. Well, here I am. Well, I say, where's Peter, by the way? Why isn't he having tea with us? Because it looks as if he's been scrobbled. I say, has he? Well, the silly ass had some notion to go exploring on his own over at Hope under Chester's. It all does seem to centre there. And he hasn't come back, so they've probably got him now. Oh, well, this is our holiday and a half. Mm, those muffins were all very well, but what I need is to have a scale and for some underdone chops and plenty of them. Build up my nervous system. Oh, well, here she is now. Well, hello there, Miss Mariah. Hello. Welcome back. My, this is quite a household. People appearing and disappearing every second minute. 
And just look at this now, Master Kay, that I came in to show you. What is it, Ellen? The latest edition of the paper. Just look. Unparalleled atrocity. More horrors at Tachester. Reign of terror in Cathedral City. We regret to say that tonight, in addition to the disappearance of the bishop, the dean, and the canons, we have to report the complete removal of the precentor, the vesture, the bursa, the canons minor, the archdeacon, the vergers, the organist, and it is feared the entire choir, including the choir boys, torn sobbing from the arms of their sorrowing mothers. Grave fears for midnight service. Intolerable outrage to law, says well-known police inspector. And so, so it built towards the final climax, whatever it might be. Victory for Abner and the powers of darkness, or victory for Cole and the powers of light. For there was something I'd suspected, since ever I'd known of old Arnold of Toady, lost in the past. And later, I overheard Abner himself confirming it, when he was talking to the chubby man. But of course, of course. Cole Hallings is Raymond Lully, my chubby Charles, the magician. Go on, Chief. You mean the chap who did the box trick at the Coliseum? No, I do not. I mean the so-called good philosopher of the Middle Ages, the discoverer of the elixir of life and the owner of the box of delights. I'll tell you it was a box trick. He has lived through the centuries in disguises innumerable, and here he is now as Cole Hallings and in my power. Now, that's all very well, Chief. But never mind all this talk about magicians and such like old cough drops. What about the boodle in hand? The boodle in hand. Now would be the time to make our own little pile. Now that me and the rest of the gang are back on our own two legs and not on four. The archbishop's offering a reward of a thousand pounds for the return of the bishop or the dean before this special service of vows and reduced sums accordingly. Twenty-five quid even for a choir boy. Oh, fool! Fool and don't tell us! Twenty-five for a choir boy, a paltry thousand for deans and bishops. I may have my own personal treasure tucked away in my room, gathered through worldwide years of villainy. I know you have. Oh, you do, do you? That good lady of yours told me. And enough to last any man a lifetime, be all accounts. But not for all eternity. I shall have more. I must have more. Infinite riches in a little room, as the poet says. And I shall have them. Or under conjugate weir goes that shining brood of merry Christmas shepherds. I shall flood them to eternity. Where else the sacred river swishes with organists and boys and bishes down to a sunless sea. <laughs> Enough. Enough to work. It was all clear, all devilishly clear. The return of the entire cathedral staff or their death by drowning under the mighty sluices. And all in exchange for Cole's elixir and the box, wherever it might be. And that was, of course... With me. It's only with me. And I remember to this day the small, lost sense of an immense responsibility that was suddenly in me. There was only one course. To go myself to that great underground network of caverns under the missionary college by the weir itself. To go swift and to go small, child Roland to the dark tower. And as I did, I remember praying. Oh, greatness hear, oh, brightness hark, leave us not little nor yet dark. <laughs> indeed my shining sylvia thus to the final act of all and abner's shining curtain to it i await your merest word my amethyst will you consult the boy i will consult the boy and i will consult the great bronze head do you hear rat hey that's what maybe they'll have a mouthful of mildewed haggy for a jet be silent rat 
I shall consult all my terrible familiars, <laughs> and then we shall see what really is what. Even the crone. Yes, <gasps> even the crone herself. <gasps> But I am told that the Archbishop is talking of trying to hold the Thousandth Service, after all, with a skeleton staff of volunteers from other dioceses. And that must be prevented at all costs. Let us go, my friends. Let us go to mighty Abner's triumph. Oh, all right, all right, then. Anything for a morsel of green bacon rind someday. Come on, Elf lad, and give us a word to cheer. Oh, George, George. And if you want to know where I was at this building moment, I was in the turn-up of Abner's own trousers. The way it fell out was this. I did go small, and I did go swift, and I found myself in Abner's own room at the college. It was strangely, sparsely furnished for a man of such tastes, but in one corner there was a massive oaken chest, which I guessed contained that terrible wizard's personal treasure, amassed through heaven knew what years of villainy. And then Abner himself and Sylvia Daisy Pouncer and the rats came in, as you just heard, I hid in a corner by the fireplace, and when they went, I knew that at my size I'd no hope to follow them, and so I did slip into the turn-up of his trousers and overheard everything as they went up and down in lifts and through endless deep corridors towards a vast metal door. And so behold it, my friends. Behold the very dungeons themselves. So. Do you think it really wise, my Abby, to summon your familiars? Hey, that's what. Good, good, but good. Silence, silence, all. I will summon them. The boy himself, and eke the head. Come, come, my monsters. Come. Come on, me monsters. Well, boy. All you want me no now, and me and me at my wrist. No pertness. Tell me what Cole Hawlings did with his box. He gave it to somebody to keep for him. I've told you that before. Learn civility. To whom did he give it? I don't know. He put spells round it. I couldn't see the person. I let me go. Ah, if you're not careful and civil, I'll peg you into the waterfall, boy. No, no, no. Please, no, great master. Then tell me this at least. Am I nearer to getting the box than I was? Yes, yeah, you're very near to it now. Shall I get it? You will have it under your hand to die. Ah. Now I want to go. I've told you everything. Don't try to dictate to me. Is there anything that you want to ask this hideous thing, Rat? Aye, there is that. What will win the national next year? Da. Kubuda, my heaven, really. Kubuda, Kubuda. Enough of this intolerable folly. Go, boy. Into the waterfall. Oh, no, no, Master. No, 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 no. So, and now you, my great bronze head. Command me, Master. Tell me of our plans. Your agents have now captured every clergyman attached to the cathedral. I know that, fool. Do you want to be turned upside down on your pedestal there? No, no, master, not that. Then tell me, what is the world outside trying to do against me this snowy Christmas tide with its cursed carols and its cursed ancient superstition? All sorts of things, mainly telephoning and telegraphing, trying to get substitutes for the great service. They'll rake up clergy from all sorts of places for it. We'll see about that. I raise my left hand, 
so come my crone no no uh, no be silent woman come crone i say master what do you want with me master I want a storm out of the north and the east with snow. I can't give it to you, ask too much. I can only sell a storm for the great sum, the bag of amethyst. Give me a storm from the north and east, or I will torment you in a way that you'll remember. Give me at least half a bag of amethysts. I need them for a cordial, I make. I will give you a quarter bag. There. Now, let me have the storm. Yeah, you must get a leather bag, great Abner. Open two strings from the mouth of it, and you will fill the roads and air with snow. So that neither cars nor aeroplanes can get past. And let any clergyman who tries to get there be buried in a six-foot drift and not be found until the spring. He cannot do that. He cannot take life. Do not interrupt me, you. Go, crone. I go, my. As for you, Ed, you have interrupted me and you have criticized me. All this establishment seems given over to mutiny. I can trust no one. You shall be upside down for a while. No, master, I implore you not. No, no. There. There. Oh. Oh, master, master. Let that teach you to mend your manners. <laughs> and now, I go to see Cole Hawley. And so, Cole Hawley's awe, Raymond Lully. The time has come, great master, for us to talk together. I have nothing to say to you, Abner Brown. You are so beset by my power that you can never escape from here without my leave. I have it on good authority that the box will be under my hand this very night. It will be mine for a plaything. Your evil plaything. Once long ago, you walked from Spain to Italy to buy the box with your elixir of life. When I have used it for a space... I shall sell the box back to you for that same elixir. Will you deal? No, I will not. Because you are a greedy scoundrel, unfit to have a long life. Ah, very well then. Stay there in your chains. I will repeat my offer once more tonight when I have made certain preparations. After that, you will see, great Raymond. You will see. Ah. And now he moved at speed, as if he determined on a course of swift action, and I moved with him. I was desperate, but that diminutive size, there seemed nothing I could do. To have disclosed myself to Co in front of Abner would have been fatal. I could only hope that in some way I might be able to return and set him and all the others free. But how? How? And now we were in Abner's room again, with his great personal treasure chest. And it was here that there befell the most terrible moment of all for me. It happened like this. He stooped to throw the chest open, and I seized the chance to slip out from his turn-up, lest it should see me as he bent down. I hid in a corner by the fireplace, and I saw him start to transfer the bags of treasure to a smaller and more portable deed box, and all the time gloating evilly to himself. Oh... Oh, my life work, or the work of my first great life of villainy, with more, more yet to come. Ah, my diamonds here, and my host of pearls, in with them. Fashionable things, pearls. Liver disease in the oyster, I understand, but ladies don't know that. Ah, and the countess's sapphires here, that there was such a fuss about. Blue and yellow, my favorite stone. When the box comes, I can sail with these in my submarine to my quiet island. Raymond Lully will see wisdom. 
He will grant me the elixir too before I go, forsaking all others. This day next week, instead of a foot of snow from my blizzard outside, there will be the tropical island. Instead of my hated Sylvia Panza and those dotes Joe and Charles, there will be peace and the past to enter and plunder at will. Oh, happy Abner. Oh, 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 oh. And this romantic pile of my so-called missionary college. With what splendor shall I pass from here? No more than a gurgling flood. For I have packed you, my mighty treasure, and will return for you in a moment. So... And now I go to open the sluices. And this was when disaster loomed. For in his final hurry, Abner picked up me, my tiny size, with the last of the jewel packages and slammed down the lid. And I made a terrible discovery as I groped and struggled among those millions to go swift and escape. The box, the box of delights. I've lost it. It must have slipped from my pocket. I shall never, never, never be myself again. Oh, greatness here, oh, brightness, hark. How long I lay there, smothered and horrified, I know not. I couldn't think, I couldn't hope. But then I heard stealthy footsteps, and there came the first hint of a flaw in Abner's plan. For the lid of the deed box was thrown open, and I found myself staring up into the faces of the chubby man and the foxy man and Sylvia Daisy Panza. Well, you see, my Panza, what? I told you he's been ailing to put a double cross on us. Oh, so you did, Joe. And I thought so too for some time. And here's the boodle, all packed up and ready for a private getaway. False, hearted, treacherous Abner. Quick, into our suitcase with it all, package after package. And it's we who make the private getaway with it all and desert him, all his mad magic schemes. I always knew we'd go too far one day. Hurry, hurry, Joe and Charles, my amethyst and my emerald. Come as finish, sweet Sylvia, and then out to the motor plane. Ah, what? But not before we foiled him in other ways too. Come. Wait, wait a moment. We've left something. That's nothing at all, my dear Sylvia. Only a little bit of rag, a scrap of jeweler's chamois. I'll throw it in the fire. Come, hurry now, before Edna comes back for his loot. Quickly, Charles, fill the deed box up with coal, so that the monster will never suspect. My Sylvia, what an inspiration. Never was your equal born. Now, ah! And that little fragment of rag, that jeweler's chamois, was none other than two-inch-high Kay Harker. As Charles threw me into the grate as they rushed off, I luckily fell into the ashes and not into the fire itself. And then, a moment later, Abner did come back himself, and I scrambled blindly into his turn-up again as he snatched up the deed box and hurried back to his last scene of all with Cole Horings. <laughs> Merry old soul. I have only one thing to say to you, the last chance of all, as I promised. I want your elixir. How about it? No, I have told you. Do you see this great iron wheel in the rock face? It works the sluices by which I can flood these cellars at will, and another sluice by the lake above completes the process. I think that even the elixir would hardly preserve you from 20 feet of water, chained as you are. Whether it will preserve me or not will be known later. But my secret shall not preserve you from anything through any weakness of mine. You have nothing with which to bargain. I have the box, or I shall have the box. You are not ignorant of magic, Red Lily. As I raise my left hand, so you shall see my helper, my familiar, and you will hear from his own lips that the box of delights will be mine before this Christmas Eve midnight. That may convince you. Come, boy. What now? What now, master? Ah, 
I see you are all dripping wet. The waterfall has taken some of the insolence from you, it would seem. No, no, not again, Master. Please, not again. We shall see. I may have even worse in store for you. Come, tell this gentleman, this box that I search for, shall I not have it by midnight? No! What? You told me. I didn't. I said you'd have it under your hand, and you have had it under your hand. It had been on your very person through the agency of K. Harker. K. Harker, that little mildew of a boy who cheated me once before of a great treasure. Uh, that's I Where is he? Tell me instantly. I won't tell you another thing more. You can peg me under the waterfall or melt me in the car or blow me through the wind, yet I'll never tell you another thing. So that's what I call squid to you, Abner Brown. I shall strike you on the head uh, and it will telescope into your chest and your legs will spindle up through your shoulders. So, so there, boy. Oh, I, I don't care. I finish. You have the brown. You have failed, and so your power over me has ended. I shall regain my proper shape. There will be no more waterfalls. You have failed. So a jolly good squeak to you. Squeak, Abner. Squeak! You see, Abner Brown, you have deceived yourself. The box will not be yours, nor shall my secret be yours. Oh, very well. I still have other helpers beyond any part of yours. I am not to have your elixir, it seems, and I am not to have your box, but I shall still have something, and that is my revenge on you. Behold, I turn the Ah, I love the noise of the running water. As the poet says, beauty born of murmuring sound does pass into my face. <laughs> and now to the lake to turn the other great sluice wheel and then off with my little earnings to a place of rest and beauty. Farewell, Raymond Lully. Ah, uh, if only that wretched mildew of a boy, K. Harker, were with you to share your fate. Farewell. A long farewell. Mr. Hollings, Mr. Hollings. Ah, is that you after all, Master Harker? I was in the turn-up of Abner's trousers. I've just slipped out to see if I can help you in some way. You're very kind, Kay. But if I were you, I wouldn't keep that size, poor boy. No bigger than my thumb. I can't help it. I've lost your box, Mr. Hollings. It was shaken out of my pocket somewhere. I'm sorry. Oh, that's a pity indeed. It might have saved us. Isn't there some other way? Some other magic you could work? No, I... Ah, but wait. Yes. Yes. Yes, there might be. Now that you are with me, Kay, have you such a thing as a pencil and a bit of paper? I'm afraid I haven't. Then do you see my coat in the corner there that they took from me? If you can rummage in the pocket, you'll find paper and pencil, I dare say. I'll, I'll try. Ah, that's the style. Well climbed, well climbed, sir. Have you got them? Yes, yes, I have. But I can, I can hardly drag them out. The pencil's like a telegraph pole. Try, try harder, good boy. Uh, uh, there. Oh, I just managed it. Phew. Now, can you draw, Kay? I'm not very good. Except sometimes at horses going from right to left. Then let us attempt two horses coming to stamp and gnash and bite these chains of mine in two. I'll do my best, although the pencil's terribly heavy. There. Will that do? Splendid. Now, stand the paper up on its edge and watch. They're coming alive. They're real. And getting bigger and bigger every moment, you see. Steady, steady, my lads. Come, bite my chains with your strong white teeth. And while they're at it, will you draw a man in a big rowing boat, Kay, and with a bunch of keys in his hand to set the others free along there? I'll try. Good, 
good, my splendid boy. And no, the last dream gone. So off with you. And there's the boatman, Mr. Hawlings. Although his nose isn't very good, it's like a stick. I never could do noses. It will serve, it will serve. Now watch again. He's coming alive, too. Right through and floating on the flood. Ahoy! Ahoy there, shipmates! Good even to you, friend. And a Merry Christmas. Will you take us aboard? Right gladly, shipmates. And a Merry Christmas likewise. So come then, Kay, in the palm of my hand. Thank you, Mr. Hawlings. And so forward with us, sobre las olas. And I shall take this other pair of skulls myself to help us on our way. The flood's rising terribly. We could navigate it, young sir. I wasn't pilot to great Jason and his Argonauts for nothing. Which course, Captain? Along the corridor there, I fancy. Though I can't be quite sure. Aye, aye, sir. Away we go. Wait! Wait, Mr. Hollings. Look there! Something shining on that rock ledge. So there is indeed. It's your box, it's your box. It's returned to you after all. You're right, young master, as it always does sooner or later. Pull over, friend, starboard. Starboard it is, Captain. And there, I have it. And the first thing with it is to set you back in your proper shape, young master. Thank you, Mr. Hollings. So low. Ah. Oh. oh, thank you. Thank you. Now, quickly again. Now, forward. Forward. And keep your keys handy for the cells, Mr. Boatman. I believe we shall manage it yet, so we will. Aye, aye, sir. Ahoy, ahoy, la! Ship ahoy! There, there! They're there already, all waiting for us. Ahoy, there, your grace! Ahoy, ahoy! And if it isn't young K. Harker himself come to save us, and my good old friend through the center is Carol Hawling, the punch and duty man. Look! Look up above there! The motor plane! No! No, there, Nervy, my love! You thought to diddle me, did you? The answer! Foil! Foil! That last, my ever shining! Goodbye, forever! Quick, Joe! Drop it on it! Hi, hi, ma'am! Frush! And so on with us! sad indignity after all of great Abner, my ancient enemy. For all his sins, requiescat. And now we were on the placid lake, and coming down to the shore to meet us was the Lady of the Ring herself, in a great sleigh drawn by lions and unicorns. In another moment, we were all aboard with her, and surging through the night, towards the cathedral, every single one of us, down to the very smallest choir boy of all. And how shall I ever describe that magical journey of that unforgettable Christmas Eve? We soared into the very heavens, the little unicorn hooves striking sparkles out of the air. The shining snowy country spread out far below us, starred by the lights of the villages, and the river gleamed where it caught the moonlight. And as we went, we all fell silent. And now we were down from the heavens and skimming over the feathery snow itself, piled high in the narrow lanes after the great storm. All the church bells of all the parishes were ringing. The tremblings of their music went thronging by in the swift air. We saw the great pinnacled tower of the cathedral, all floodlit for this splendid thousandth night. And in the square, a mighty multitude was gathered. Among them, the red and white ranks of the famous Catcher Regiment, the Catcher Toms, all ready to fire a salute of cannon as a signal for the stroke of midnight itself. And while the bishop and the choir and all the helpers went hurrying to Rome, 
we met all the Jones girls, smiling at the very cathedral door itself, and with them was the Barney dog, running as pleased as Punch himself to greet his master. And so we all went in. The cathedral was crowded. Even the Triforium and Clear Stories, as well as every space in it, were packed with faces. The vestry door curtains fell back to each side, and to the sound of music, out came the bishop's glorious procession, with all the great cathedral crosses and blessed banners. vast building. It seemed to me, I remember, that it was shaking it to very pieces. All the heads came off, all the bodies, and moved up into the air. I myself was being shaken to pieces. My own head was coming off right through the cathedral roof. In fact, the cathedral was no longer there at all, nor any of all that glorious company. No. No, I was in an empty railway carriage on a bitterly cold day and the train had just drawn in. I was at Condicott Station, with my pocket full of money, just home for the holidays, and Miss Caroline Louisa was shaking and waking me. Why, Kay, wake up. Wake up, my dear. You have been sound asleep. Welcome home and a Merry Christmas. Have you had a nice dream? Oh, yes. Yes, I have. Oh, yes, I have. And a Merry Christmas to you, too, Miss Caroline. A Merry, Merry Christmas to everyone. Box of Delights, or When the Wolves Were Running, a fantasy by John Macefield, freely dramatized for radio by John Keir Cross. The cast was as follows. Kay Harker as a man, Harmon Grisewood. Kay Harker as a boy, Patricia Hayes. Cole Hallings, Cyril Shapps. Abner Brown, Felix Felton. Rat, Norman Shelley. Miss Caroline Louisa and Jemima Jones, Carol Marsh, Mariah Jones, Joe Manning Wilson, Susan Jones, Sean Davis, Peter Jones, Eva Hatton, Sylvia Daisy Panzer, Joan Matheson, Alf Ratt, Stanley Unwin, The Foxy-Faced Man, Henry Stamper, The Chubby Man, Wilfred Babbage, The Lady of the Ring, Noel Hood, The Police Inspector, Hector Ross, and The Bishop, Preston Lockwood. The play was produced by David Davis.